Now we're going to look this morning at Philippians chapter 2 and verses 1 to 5. You'll find it on page 1162 of the church Bibles. And I'm going to pray and then set up the video clip that we're going to watch, a short video clip, and then we'll be on our way studying this passage of Scripture, Philippians chapter 2 and verses 1 to 5. Let's pray. Father, again, as we seek your face in these moments of prayer and as we anticipate continuing to worship in the presence of the living God through the unchanging truths of Holy Scripture, we just would ask, Lord Jesus, for your honor and glory that you just grab our hearts once again and lift us into that presence where there is a deep connectedness with you an intimacy and an openness on our part that allows you to do that wonderful, that gracious, sanctifying work in our lives through the Word of God that you so beautifully want to do. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, on this Sunday before Remembrance Day, let's continue as we already have to honor God by honoring our nation, thanking God for our beautiful country. And let's honor God by honoring our servicemen and women, past and present, by watching this short video clip of our Royal Canadian Air Force Snowbirds in action. Whenever and wherever the Snowbirds perform, it is a stunning display of precision teamwork, of unity and harmony in the air. And here you have pilots, skilled fighter pilots, flying their Tudor jets as close as one meter apart at speeds of up to 600 kilometers per hour again. It's a stunning display of teamwork. In the passage of scripture that we're going to look at together this morning from Philippians chapter 2, it is a block of scripture that's all about teamwork and about precision and about unity and working together as one in our Lord Jesus Christ, in the body of Christ. And so I want you, having found that scripture, and uh, you've got your finger in it, open it up, follow along now as I read the first five verses of of Philippians chapter 2. If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility. Consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. Paul, in writing these words to the believers in that local church faith community in the first century city of Philippi, challenged those believers to live very enthusiastically, very overtly in their unity, in their oneness in the Lord Jesus Christ. My friends, as we, followers of Jesus here at Harvest, in humble dependence upon the Spirit of God, live before our God and in our relationships one with another, the unity that is ours in Christ Jesus, what inevitably happens is that the aroma of the joy of our Lord Jesus fills the place. And not only that, Maximum outward impact is hugely ramped up as all of the world knows that we're followers of Jesus by virtue of the love that we have one for another. All right, then, let's focus on the first verse where Paul opens up this passage of Scripture which focuses on living in unity in the body of Christ, and he makes a factual declaration. Verse 1. If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, and he's going to go on to say in verse 2, then make my joy complete by being like-minded. In that first verse, Paul makes four if statements, but he's not conveying some sort of doubt. To the contrary, Paul's simply employing a Greek rhetorical device. It's as if over and over he's saying, if you know that this to be true, and we all know that it is, 
will then allow that truth to grab your heart and motivate you to respond and in a specific way and in the context of the scripture, the specific way of obedience that Paul is calling us to respond to God is by living out our unity in Christ. So what were those four if statements which don't express doubt but instead confident truth that Paul detailed in that first verse? Well, he says this to the believers at Philippi, to us at Harvest today through the pages of Holy Scripture. Hey, guys, has anyone ever experienced in their life any encouragement from the Lord Jesus? And we would say, yes, we have. Has anyone ever experienced any of the warmth and the comfort of the love of the Lord Jesus? And we would say, yes, we have. Has anyone ever experienced a moment of profound intimacy and fellowship with the Spirit of God? Where the Lord was just so real to you? And we would say, yes, we have. Has anyone ever experienced the lavish mercy and grace and forgiveness of the living God poured into your life in Christ Jesus? And we would say again, yes, we have. So Paul says, all right then, you who have been the lavish recipients of this love and grace from God that you don't deserve and didn't earn, God just chose to pour it into your lives then allow that to motivate you to respond to the Lord your God in a specific manner of obedience out of hearts of love. Isn't this kind of cool? Paul reminds us as he speaks of these blessings of God's mercy that he has so generously poured into our lives, he reminds us that God didn't say to us, look, if you do this or that, I'll bless you. It's not the way God operates. Paul says, oh no, God poured all of these blessings into our lives well before we were even really seeking him, but he was working to draw us into our lives, into his life, into his heart, and then once we were followers of the Lord Jesus, he has continued over and over and over daily to pour these mercies into our lives. Again, not because we earn them, just because this is the heart of God. He's a God of compassion and grace. So now, Allow all of the grace that God has poured into your life, the lavish love of Jesus that you're living in, allow it to grab your heart and motivate you to honor your Father by living in the oneness in your relationships one with another in the body of Christ that he's given to you in Christ Jesus. Can I share just kind of a moment of confession here? Confession is good for the soul. Here I go. So we were driving Grace and I to prayer retreat this past week, and we got a little bit of a late start on Monday, and it was nip and tuck as to whether or not we were going to make the supper. So I found myself driving through the mountain parks, and I was pushing it a little. Okay, I wasn't ridiculously speeding. I was living in that realm of grace. You know your legitimate 10% over the speed limit? And maybe a little bit more. And then I spotted the police cruiser. Can I tell you, I had an instant bout of spirituality. (laughs) Just like that, I came right back to where I should have been driving the entire time. And it reminded me of a fundamental principle. Belief inevitably informs behavior. I believe that that police officer had the authority and the justification to give me a speeding ticket... But in God's mercy, in that moment, I got a get-out-of-jail-free card. Just got to go to prayer retreat, no ticket. But belief inevitably informs behavior. So Paul would admonish us, invite us to camp out on the grace of God, such as he describes in verse 1. He says, believe that stuff. Like, understand and camp out on this truth, these biblical facts that God has poured all of these mercies into your life. And as we do, what we believe will impact in how we behave. And specifically within the context of this passage, we'll find ourselves motivated to work with a little extra diligence to live in the visible expression of the oneness that is ours in Christ Jesus. Well, that's the factual declaration. In verse 2, then, we have a corporate exhortation. 
Now Paul is going to speak to the believers in that church, that local community of faith in Philippi, and say, here then, in response to the mercy of God, is how I want you guys to lean into Jesus to find strength to live. Verse 2. If all of these things that I've been talking about are true, and we know they are, verse 2, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose. Paul throws a handful of phrases together that really all say the same thing. It's a simple exhortation, a simple admonishment to the believers in Philippi to live in their unity in Christ Jesus. It's like a speaker who is trying to make her point. And uh, so she repeats herself and says the same thing a few different ways so that the audience can't possibly miss the point she's trying to make. That's what Paul really does here in verse 2 when he piles phrase upon phrase upon phrase that in the bottom line just means this. Philippian followers of Jesus, in response to the overwhelming grace of God upon your lives, live before your Lord in unity. What is unity? What would that look like in the body of Christ? Well, for one, it's not uniformity. Unity is never to be confused with uniformity. If a whole bunch of people always think the same way on everything and agree all the time about everything, then some of those people aren't necessary. Unity is not uniformity. Uniformity is the cookie cutter syndrome, which says that everybody has to act alike, think alike, dress alike, speak alike, and we would say that's not unity. In fact, uniformity is unhealthy. We celebrate here at Harvest our incredible diversity. Amen? We come from various different backgrounds. We come from various parts of the planet. We have different likes and dislikes. We have different areas of giftedness and talent in our lives. And those are things that we celebrate. We celebrate our diversity. No unity in the body of Christ is a diverse people coming together to rally around King Jesus and his unchanging gospel and this incredible truth that he invites us calls us to be on mission with him to demonstrate and declare his love to the world. That's what we rally around at Harvest. That's unity. You know what else? The unity that's ours in Christ Jesus, it's not something that we have to try to manufacture. We already have it. Amen? I mean, Paul would argue this absolutely forcefully. In 1 Corinthians 12 and Ephesians chapter 4, he would say, wait a minute, people. There's one Lord Jesus Christ and one church, and Jesus is the head over that one church, and every genuine follower of Jesus is indwelled by the same Spirit of God. We possess together one hope in our Lord Jesus, and he is soon to return. And just pondering this profound truth that the very Spirit of the Lord Jesus Christ is indwelling all of us, who have simply yielded our faith, lives and faith to Christ Jesus, that's a huge thing. We're not talking about manufacturing some unity. We've already got it. In ways we couldn't begin to imagine, what we want to do then is to lean into Jesus, to find grace and strength to increasingly express and live out in our relationships in real life what is our uh, essential identity and that identity is this. We are one in the Lord Jesus Christ. So here at Harvest, and this is the heart of Harvest, we say that we want to grow in terms of becoming fully devoted followers of Jesus. It's another way of saying we want to be the real deal, live our faith 24-7 and grow in that. We will grow in terms of being fully devoted followers of Jesus as we believe in Christ. We want to trust in Jesus, first of all, as the only one who could ever rescue us from our sins. And then we want to lean in Jesus daily to find strength and grace in him. 
to honor the Father by the very lives that we live. And we will grow in terms of being fully devoted followers of Jesus as we belong to our church. Now, belonging to church certainly includes coming together for corporate worship. That's significant, such as we're engaging in right now. But it's more than that, so much more. It means that I'm aggressively engaged in my church family. I am allowing the Spirit of God to work through me and my gifts to minister Christ Jesus into the lives of others. And in turn, I'm receiving ministry and being built up in the Lord Jesus Christ. We're talking about aggressively belonging to the body of Christ. And then, and then we will grow in terms of being fully devoted followers of Jesus as we bless our community, our nation, our world. We remind ourselves often that we want to be Jesus' hands and feet and voice, demonstrating in our community the love of the Lord Jesus Christ through selfless acts of service and declaring boldly with our mouths the fact that King Jesus died and rose and he will transform the life of anyone who in simple, sincere faith yields their life to him. That's the heart of harvest. This wonderfully diverse group of people that God has brought together here, that's what we rally around, getting to know Jesus more, becoming increasingly his fully devoted followers, and increasingly being conformed by the Spirit's work in our lives into the very image of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now make no mistake about it. When a group of believers in the Lord Jesus is diligently working on living in the expression of their oneness in Christ Jesus, such as Paul admonishes the Philippian believers to live in in that second verse, that's a powerful thing. That's a compelling thing, right? A preacher from another era, a guy by the name of Vance Habner, would say, Christians like snowflakes are frail, but when they stick together, they can stop traffic. We know that's true in our part of the world. When we're one and leaning into the Lord Jesus and empowered by his Holy Spirit, we are a powerful force for the glory of the living God and for the blessings that God wants to pour into the lives of many. But the flip side is a nightmare. When a church family is not living in unity, instead this faith community is marked by discord and disharmony, that's a nightmare. At this most recent prayer retreat that we were so blessed to be able to attend, the speaker was our president, Dave Hearn. He talked about a time back when he was the district superintendent of the British Columbia District, and they arrived at this very, very difficult decision that they would have to actually shut a local church down in a certain community because that fellowship had just been marked by such division and such strife for so long. They just really felt before God there was no other alternative. So they shut the church down. And then Dave says that he went to all the other churches in the community and he apologized to them and asked for their forgiveness for the reproach to the gospel that this one church over here had caused over and over and over in the community because of the ongoing strife. When followers of the Lord Jesus are not living under the leadership of God's Holy Spirit and are doing it their way and are living in disunity within the body of Christ, the results are horrific. It's no wonder then that the Apostle Paul would admonish us in Ephesians chapter 4 to make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. On another occasion, we reminded ourselves that our expression of unity within the body of Christ is something that grows slowly, but it can be lost quickly. So we must work at it diligently. And again, when God's people are living in their oneness in Christ Jesus and walking in obedience to the Spirit in the expression of it, wow, joy is ramped way up. 
and impact in the lives of people for the glory of God, it's through the roof. Inevitably, it happens. But we have to be diligent about it. We have to be heads up. So how then do we as individual followers of Jesus have a part to play in terms of growing in this unity and its expression of the body of Christ? That's where we're going to conclude this morning in verses 3 to 5 where Paul talks about us very personally and we have a personal application. Verse 3, Paul says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition and vain conceit. Focus on the two phrases, selfish ambition and vain conceit. The phrase selfish ambition actually comes from the political arena in Paul's day. And uh, it was a kind of a dark word in Paul's day, which envisioned some backroom dealing, some uh, under-the-table politicking, and the result was a factious party spirit. People pitted against one another. It's the kind of thing that was going on in the Corinthian church where one uh, group of people said, hey, I'm a Paul guy. And another group said, actually, I'm a Peter follower. And another group said, actually, we're Apollos people. And the body of Christ was just divided into all these competitive and adversarial groups. Paul says, whatever you do, please don't go there. That's an utter abdication of living in the unity that yours in Christ Jesus. Have nothing to do in the body of Christ with being a part of anything that would result in this kind of factious division within the body of Christ where you've got different groups of people within the same church family that are actually in an adversarial relationship one with another. Don't go there, says Paul, have nothing to do with that. And then he gives us that second phrase, vain conceit. This word, vain conceit, actually translates one word, and it's kenodoxian. It's a two-part word. Second part of the word is doxa, and that just means glory. So we get words like the doxology. The first part of the word is kenos, means empty. So put it together, and what you've got is empty of glory. Empty of glory. In other words, this is a person who's hungry for glory. They want to be acknowledged, whether they you know, expressly state that or not. In their heart of hearts, they just want people to get who they are. And how brilliant their ideas are and what everything it is that they have to contribute to the body of Christ. And they will tell you all of their great ideas whether you want to hear them or not. This is your proverbial loose cannon. And the motivation in it all, says Paul, for this individual is they're starving for glory. For attention to be acknowledged. Again, Paul would say, follow, followers of Jesus in Philippi and followers of Jesus at Harvest... Don't go there. Have nothing to do with that. Instead, instead behave how? So that you can be on side with raising up within the body of Christ the expression of unity for the glory of God. Instead, do this. Middle of verse 3. In humility, consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. My friends, right there, that is the upside down world of the gospel of Christ. What we just read is dramatically counterintuitive to the world in which we live. I love this statement by Ted Turner, who has never been known as a poster boy for modesty. On one occasion, Ted said, if I had a little bit of humili humility, I'd be perfect. <laughs> kind of made me chuckle when I read it. That's kind of the way the world operates a lot, but the Lord Jesus comes into this world and he says, we're going to do this radically different. And guess what he does? In a way that we could not begin in a hundred lifetimes to wrap our heads around the king of glory, the eternal son of God actually so condescended himself that he came into this world to become a fertilized egg in the womb of a teenage virgin. It's absolutely mind-blowing stuff. It's a kind of humility, as Paul is going to go on to unfold in this second chapter of Philippians, that is unrivaled in all of history and in all of the universe. And that's our example. Paul says, we got to be like Jesus. 
instead of the selfish ambition or vain conceit, we need in humble dependence upon the Spirit of God to walk in the humility of the Lord Jesus. Humility, such as Paul uses in that third verse, conveys this idea of we're confident before our God in who he's made us to be and who we are in the Lord Jesus and in the gifts that he's placed into us so that we don't feel the need to be arrogant or selfishly ambitious. Instead, we're free to honor God by serving others. I like what C.S. Lewis so famously once said. He said, humility is not thinking less about yourself. It's thinking about yourself less. And that's what Paul is talking about. The humility of the Lord Jesus Christ where my eyes are off myself a little bit more and a little bit more on everybody else. Now we know that it's only by a genuine humility that we even come into the family of God. A person who's got to bow their knee before the Lord Jesus and confess that he's king and Lord, that he died and rose. That he's the only way I could ever have my sins forgiven, be brought into a relationship with God and receive the free gift of forever life. So becoming a follower of Jesus necessary begins with humility. There's no other way. We have to acknowledge, I could never get my way into heaven on my own. I could never work off my sins on my own. I must humbly cast myself upon a Savior who is our Lord Jesus Christ. Then, as we move forward in our journey with Jesus, seeking to live out our faith now 24-7, how would we grow in humility? How would we partner with the Spirit of God to cultivate this beautiful character quality of Christ Jesus in our lives? Well, first of all, then I would say as followers of Jesus, we're going to have to acknowledge that we need to grow in humility. That our default setting is that we're proud people. Can we agree that in our essence we are proud, arrogant people? Maybe we're not so sure. Do you find yourself argumentative? Do you find yourself secretly bemoaning other people's successes? Do you find yourself quick to criticize, to complain? Do we find ourselves growing and it's becoming easier for us in terms of admitting to someone, yes, you're right, I'm wrong, will you forgive me? If someone were to read Philippians chapter 2 and verses 3 to 5, would I, would you immediately spring to their mind? We would acknowledge humbly before our God with gratitude for the work that he's done in our lives that, yeah, in our essence, we're proud people. We're independent people. And our default setting is to do it our way for ourselves. And so we say, Lord Jesus, forgive and cleanse us. And then we say, by your blessed Holy Spirit, indwelling me as a genuine follower of Christ, fill me, control me, I receive it by faith. And now, Spirit of God, work in and through me this beautiful humility of the Lord Jesus Christ. And when the Spirit of God is in control of our lives as we yield to him and the Spirit's living the humility of Jesus through us, you don't need to tell anybody. It'll be obvious because Paul says our eyes will be off ourselves. We'll start to see others. We'll look to the interests of others. We want to come alongside others and minister to them and bless them and encourage them and serve them and pray for them. And as we, as individual followers of Jesus, live in that place of yieldingness to the Spirit such that he's working the humility of Christ through us, guess what? At an individual level, we're hugely onside with raising up the expression in the body of Christ of this dynamic of our oneness in the Lord Jesus. And that means we're also a part of seeing joy go up and our maximum outward impact increase. Pretty cool that at an individual level, we get to be a part of something that significant by leaning into Jesus. The young man's name was Bill. Bill was a college student. He had messy hair. He wore a tattered t-shirt. Bill wore torn jeans. He went everywhere barefoot. This had been his uh, attire for four years of college. 
During this college experience, Bill also, through an on-campus ministry, became a follower of Jesus. Well, right across from the university campus was a church, a church that believed in the gospel, believed the Bible was God's word. It was also kind of a culturally conservative church. It was a very well-dressed church. Well, one day, Bill decided to walk across the street from the university campus to the church. Now, this church had been pondering, how can we connect with the college students across the street? They weren't quite sure how to go about it. So here was Bill inadvertently, unintentionally, he was going to help them. He walked into church with his messy hair, with his tattered t-shirt, his torn jeans, and barefoot, and he walked in quite a bit late. Service was well underway. So as he comes down the center aisle, well, go figure, there's no place to sit. All of a sudden, we've got an awkward moment unfolding. But Bill is undaunted. He keeps walking down the aisle. It's a large church, so it's kind of a long aisle. And he gets right up to the stage, and there's no place to sit. So what does Bill do? Plops himself right down on the rug in the center aisle. Well, now it's a painfully awkward moment. The place is silent. And then everybody notices an elder at the back of the church with silver gray hair, pocket watch toting, three-piece suit wearing, Coming down the center aisle, he's got a cane, so it's a slow walk. This unfolds over some period of time, and everybody is thinking to themselves, oh my goodness, we know what's coming. This elder is going to dial this disrespectful young person in. And uh, it was with bated breath as this whole thing unfolds. Well, the elder came down the aisle, and what did he do? It took some effort on his part, but when he got to the young man, he actually set his cane down, and just sat down right beside him and told him that he didn't want to have to sit in church by himself. The preacher who had been waiting for this little operation to be completed before he could start his message then told everybody in church that day, what I'm about to preach, you will never remember. What you've just seen, you will never forget. God grant us for the glory of his name in humble dependence upon the Spirit of God, the humility of our Lord Jesus Christ. And as we live that humility and obedience to God in our relationships one with another, we will be a part of ramping up within the body of Christ the expression of our oneness in Jesus. And joy will be multiplied. And our impact for God's glory will be exponentially increased. God, for the glory of your name, may it be so. Amen.